So, resistance to targeted therapy in kidney cancer. So, um, uh, we all know, um, and we've heard already today, and I'm sure we'll continue to hear over the next 24 hours, that targeted agents have transformed the treatment of this disease in the last five years or so. But again, I think we all know from the clinic that the efficacy of these drugs is pretty much always transient. Resistance occurs uh, pretty much regardless of which drug you use in the first line setting. That median progression free survival uh, is almost invariably under 12 months um, with targeted therapy. Um, that in the clinic we use sequential therapy to try to prolong benefit. But the choice of drug, at least from a molecular point of view, is largely empirical. But uh, again, from we've known for decades that this is a, a heterogeneous disease in terms of its behaviour and its tempo. The critical point really is in bold at the bottom. Um, our patients ultimately die uh, because of resistance to drug therapy, and I think we should never forget that. What do we know so far about resistance to drug therapy in kidney cancer? Well, a lot of what we know is based primarily on preclinical models. Um, this cartoon, um, which is taken from a, a review a few years ago, I guess sort of codifies uh, what we might see in our own clinical experience, the idea of intrinsic resistance at the bottom, whereby you never really have any response to targeted therapy and the tumour continues to grow uh, unabated, or the idea of adaptive or perhaps acquired resistance where there is an initial response shown by pruning, if you like, of the blood vessels here, uh, but eventually um, resistance in, uh, sets in, the tumour continues to grow and the disease progresses and the patient has symptoms. So what might be the potential mechanisms of resistance to anti-VEGF therapy, for example, in advanced kidney cancer? Well, uh, no single drug is ever going to block all possible uh, angiogenic pathways. We often show these diagrams or cartoons, but this is an incredibly complicated process with uh, a number of different molecules involved, and so it, it's inevitably not possible to block them all. It might be that there is compensation as a consequence of the induction of hypoxia, um, uh, you've heard from Professor Witz already in this session, and I agree that the tumour microenvironment is likely to be important. So, for example, myeloid-derived suppressor cells. And uh, in the literature, um, there are there's good preclinical data uh, with some clinical correlations that, for example, FGF and IL-8 and a range of other factors may be relevant. In a sense, that's a sort of a, a, a view on um, where we are at the moment, what we've seen in the last few years. Um, I'd like to think a, lot, a little bit more, and, and again, this was one of the questions at the start of the session. What are the future obstacles to identifying resistance um, in kidney cancer? Well, again, this is a heterogeneous disease. The patients all behave differently clinically. Um, and molecularly, from patient to patient, there's a lot of variation. And it isn't possible at the moment to predict whether an individual will respond or be resistant to any particular drug in advance of treatment. And this is obviously a, a major um, limitation in the field. And I think a practical obstacle um, is the lack of specimens from patients for translational research. And that might be paraffin um, embedded primaries, but I think I'm particularly thinking about biopsies from patients who've actually got resistant disease. Um, collection in many ways understandably has not been mandatory um, in many registration trials and a lot of clinical trials this hasn't historically been a priority. And again, it's not just about collecting the samples, they need to be collected properly. So quality control, in um, particular for a number of molecular analyses for the collection of fresh tissue, for example, is absolutely critical. And unless you collect the tissue properly in the first place, you might find um, that you've got a freezer full of unusable tissue. Um, and so these are some of the, the, the problems that, uh, or the obstacles, I think, to identifying mechanisms of resistance in the future. The other issue that was mentioned is this idea of intratumor heterogeneity, in other words, the heterogeneity within a given tumor. And I'd like to spend the last half of the talk just um, thinking about that in kidney cancer and showing you some, some recent data from our group. We sort of became interested in this um, a year or two ago as part of the PREDICT consortium. Um, and the idea of this consortium was a, a, a European consortium of 
clinical trial centres, um, of labs, um, of industry as well, to try using so-called functional genomics to derive predictive biomarkers for anti-VEGF and anti-mTOR treatments in kidney cancer. And this was funded by the European Framework Programme 7 um, to about 6 million euros or something like that. So this was a sort of starting point for our interest in the area. Um, to try to de define these predictive biomarkers. But right at the very start, we asked ourselves this question. Does the driver, and that could be for sensitivity or resistance to the therapy, it doesn't really matter, I don't think, that you identify from the tissue at, say, time point X, which in kidney cancer is generally going to be an archival paraffin embedded nephrectomy specimen, is that driver or marker at time X, really the thing that drives the metastatic disease in the patient who is in front of you in the clinic? That was the fundamental question. And we were worried, and we were using a model system where patients who present with uh, metastatic disease who are undergoing uh, debulking cytoreductive nephrectomy, um, we were taking biopsies of these large tumours, um, and we wondered whether or not those, those biopsies of these very big tumours uh, were representative of the whole of the large primary tumour or even the burden of metastatic disease. And so this is something that we, we set out to, get for, to investigate really as a sort of a, a first point um, on the journey to try and think about predictive biomarkers. And the paper um, to describe the first few patients in one of our trials was published now a few weeks ago. So very briefly, um, what we did in the first four patients that we treated in our trial called ePredict, this is a, a pre-nephrectomy window trial of the kind that lots of groups are doing around the world. The patients were treated with uh, Everolimus for uh, having had a biopsy of the primary right at the very start. Six weeks of Everolimus. Um, nephrectomy takes place. Um, patient, when they've recovered, they go back on uh, treatment and in the future um, we try to get biopsies, if we can, of resistant sites of disease. So, for example, there's a biopsy of a liver metastasis there. I think that's projecting quite well. And we used a number of genomic techniques to analyse the primary tumour, and that's regions 1 to 9, and to compare that where we could with metastatic sites. So this is the first patient on the trial. And what you can see is this large primary tumour. You can see lots of different regions. Um, that's regions 1 to 9. And you can see in a cartoon here the primary tumour, a perinephric metastasis, which the patient happened to have, a chest wall metastasis, which was sub subsequently resected for clinical rather than research reasons and some lung metastases here. So we took multiple biopsies of the primary and also from metastases. And this is really the most important slide that I'd like to show you. So using a number of techniques but concentrating now on exome sequencing, um, we were able to identify 130 mutations in the first patient. And what you can see here um, is the mutations, if you like, going along the top of this um, graph and the different areas of the tumour um, along the right-hand side. So you've got the metastatic sites and you've got the primary here. And what you can see is that there were some mutations, um, this blue bar along the top, that were ubiquitous. In other words, every part of the tumour had those mutations. There were some that were only present at the primary sites in yellow. There were some that were only present at metastatic sites in green. And there were some that were private. That means they only occurred in one of the biopsy sites. Um, and the, the take-home message for this in many ways for us is that, that you can see that a if you took one biopsy of any part of this tumour, you may only describe a third of the mutations in that tumour. In other words, one biopsy would significantly, potentially underestimate the entire mutational burden of the tumour. Using published um, and validated methodology, it's possible to construct these tree diagrams, which I'm showing here. And what you can see again is the ubiquitous mutations on the trunk of the tree here in blue, the shared primary mutations in yellow, the shared uh, metastatic uh, mutations here in green, um, and private mutations in red. And I will draw your attention, I don't know how well this is predict, uh, projecting, to the fact that in the uh, primary tumour, they're all clustered here. Um, apart from one region of the primary here, region 4, which appears closer to the metastatic disease, suggesting potentially that it was that area of the primary that actually seeded the metastatic disease. Another important observation um, is that we actually noticed mutations, for example, in SET-D2, a key tumour suppressor, that were different in different parts of the tumour, suggesting there is a selective Darwinian evolutionary pressure to acquire these mutations in, in different parts of the same tumour. The reviewers of the paper rightly asked us, well, 
we know you've only sent us one patient to start off with, this is just a one-off. So we sequenced a second patient and we saw pretty much exactly the same thing. So I've just covered that very briefly um, and we used a number of other techniques um, that I won't describe now. But to speculate, we clearly need further data. We don't know what the general relevance of this is. It is described quite well in other tumour types, so I would be surprised if this was exclusive to kidney cancer. What are the implications for personalised medicine in terms of taking one biopsy and relying on that to tell you molecular information about the tumour? Is it different in big and small tumours? Does it change with therapy? And so on and so forth. Lots of really important and interesting questions. And I think vitally, the study of metastatic disease and comparing with the primary site um, is, is something we need to take seriously. Just in the last couple of slides, um, to turn the tree on its head, or to put it the right way up, if you like, um, you, you can see here that, that there's some speculation that maybe there are some tumours that branch, if you like, immediately as they leave the ground, like an oak tree, so that, that there's enormous amount of heterogeneity, or other tumours, perhaps they have a long trunk where the driving mutations are located and the whole of the tumour um, is susceptible to therapy targeting that. An EGFR in lung cancer, or perhaps BRAF in melanoma, may be examples examples of what you might call those truncal drivers. So to conclude, critically our patients die because of resistance to drug therapy. Understanding this is without question a major research and clinical priority. I think we have limited clinical information at the moment. Intratumor heterogeneity I think may be relevant, although clearly more work is necessary. And I think to get the best outcomes for our patients, we actually need to do rational clinical trials in which we are collecting tissue. And to do that, it's not easy, but it requires collaboration between clinicians, scientists, industry, and patient groups as well. Um, Acknowledgements, um, big team of people um, uh, in, our, in our team who are research nurses and data managers who make this possible. Um, a lab at um, Lincoln's in Fields um, and Andy Futrell and very Importantly, um, Charlie Swanson and Martin Gore, uh, my friends and colleagues. So thank you very much for your attention.